Raised by wolves with canine DNA in his blood, having trained more than 24,000 vets, helping you and your fur babies thrive. Live in studio, it's Pet Talk Today with Will Bangura answering your pet behavior and training questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host and favorite pet behavior expert, Will Bangura. Good Saturday morning, pet lovers. I'm Will Bangura, and you are listening to Pet Talk today. Here on Facebook Live, we're here each and every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m., where we take your calls, and we respond to your comment questions as well. And we're trying to help you deal with all of your dog and puppy behavior problems. Maybe you've got a young puppy with a potty training issue or it's destructive. Uh, maybe you've got an older dog that um, pulls you down the street when you're walking. Or maybe you're dealing with separation anxiety, aggression, jumping, barking, you name it. It doesn't matter. There's no problem that's too difficult. There's no dog that's too bad. Doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter. Breed. We can help you at Pet Talk today. Do us a favor, if you would, go ahead and go into the comment section. And if you would, please let us know where you're watching from. And also, please, um, in addition to that, tell us what kind of dog that you have. What kind of dog do you have? And hey, even better yet is if you put a picture of your dog in the comment section. We love that. Also, this is a labor of love. Not everybody can afford private in-home training. So I do this show so that people that can't afford training can try to get some help to improve the relationship and the bond and obviously the behavior with their, their dogs, with their puppies. Um, also, if you've got cats, we talk about cats here on Pet Talk today. Um, primarily dogs, but we do talk about cats as well. Um, I'm going to be taking calls today if you want to call in, and that's okay. Uh, the number to call if you'd like to call into the show and ask your question and get an answer, that number is 414-400-DOGS or 414-400-3647. 414-400-3647 if you want to go ahead and call in. Um, Last week, I had a message right after the show by Sandra, and I'm hoping that I'm hoping that Sandra's listening because I'm going to go ahead and answer her question. But uh, here is what uh, here's what Sandra had to say. Hello, I have a one year old rescue German Shepherd, and I'd like to know how do I keep him from jumping on me and on my cat. Thank you. So the question was, how do I keep my one-year-old German Shepherd from jumping on me and jumping on my cat? Well, the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to get a leash, okay? And I want you to hook the leash to your dog because you need to have some leverage. You know, you need to be able to manage the dog. Now, it sounds like um, if you've got a one-year-old German Shepherd, you know, they can be pretty strong. One of the things you need to start to do is ask yourself, and I tell this to all of the listeners, everybody that watches Pet Talk today, ask yourself, what is the behavior that I really want my dog to do? You know, we're, we're always talking about what we don't want them to do. What do you want them to do instead? Well, wouldn't it be nice if when they're greeting you, they would go ahead and sit for a polite greeting? So I encourage people to work really hard on the sit command and make sure that it's worth your dog's while. You know, there are people out there that don't want to use food in training. If you use it the right way, it's not a bribe. If you use it the right way, you can fade out the food down the road, but it's a paycheck. How long are you going to work without a paycheck, even if you love your job? And so the more we can motivate the dog with a very high value food reward, the better the dog's going to respond. And that means 
these hassles that we're having with these nuisance behavior go away quicker. So having a leash on the dog is going to help with the jumping, number one. Number two, working on a sit command, being proactive and working on that sit command over and over and over and over. Yes, you need to do lots of repetition because a lot of people, they they don't realize how much repetition you need. Because when you get into a distraction, um, a lot of the training just goes out the window unless you've been working on distraction proofing and unless you've been working on impulse control. And so that means a lot of repetition. That means working those commands in different areas, different locations, so that you generalize the dog's behavior responding to the cue or the command of sit. Folks, you're going to hear me um, use the words cue, command. Um, I started training dogs back in 1975, 1976. I was just a young buck uh, competing with my dogs, with my dad in AKC obedience matches. But back then it was called a command. Now we're supposed to be a little politically correct. Um, we don't want to oppress animals, and so we don't command them. You know, I don't know how you feel about that. You can comment on that if you want as well. But we're supposed to call it a cue and no longer call it a command. So I'm trying to be, uh, trying to be a little bit nicer and, uh, and do that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do today as well, and that was I wanted to go ahead and uh, spend a little bit of time today, if, if we have the time, and I think we probably will, talking about clicker training. Now, we could just as easily call that marker training, but when we're talking about clicker training, that is something that's really, really powerful. And some people know what clicker training is, but they're missing a couple pieces. Some people don't know at all. Some people think they know, and they've got it completely wrong. So I'm going to be talking um, about that as well. Again, if you're just joining us, I'm Will Bangura, and you're watching and listening to Pet Talk Today. We're here each and every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. on Facebook Live. Do us a favor, share this video share our page to your page so that more people can benefit from this and please do us a favor and uh, like go ahead and click that like button down there and click the share button as well um, the other thing i'm going to be talking about today um, we've got a couple current event news items and I'll be talking about a different kind of dog food and also going to be talking about a, a new medication um, that helps to induce dogs vomiting. But going back to Sandra, who asked the question, she's got the one-year-old German Shepherd jumping on her, jumping on her cat. All right, let's talk about the cat for a second. And we'll get back to you and the dog jumping on you. Again, having the leash on the dog to help prevent the dog from chasing after the cat. And again, giving the dog something specific to do. Um, we call it differential reinforcement, a different behavior. We want to make that trained behavior so much more valuable to the dog than chasing after the cat or jumping on the cat. So I recommend that you get one of these elevated dog cots. You can get them on Amazon. They're like $27. They're raised up off the ground, maybe two inches. Uh, they got like a mesh material. So the air, it's, it's really good. Dogs love it. You know, it's, the air breathes. It keeps them cool in the summertime. It's like their little hammock, so to speak. But you teach them to go to that place and reward them and try to bait them to come off only to walk into them, put them back onto that place cot. If they don't take the bait, because you're going to distract a little bit, we want to teach them to stay on that dog cot. That's the whole purpose of this, okay? We'll call it place. We'll teach it as an implied stay. And again, you might go, or hoo, 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 just a little bit to try to get the dog to come off the cot towards you. And as soon as that happens, walk back into the dog. Use spatial pressure. Get the dog to get back on there. If that doesn't work, help the dog with the leash. Guide the dog with the leash back onto the cot. Now, the first time you put the dog on the place cot and you command or cue place, make sure that you reward the dog, okay? And 
if the dog comes off and takes the bait and you have to re-com- recommand, give the cue again and get the dog back on place, then do not give a food reward because we're making a very black and white cause and effect association. We want the dog to understand, hey, when I stay on there, good things happen. I, I get high value food rewards. If I come off, they put me back on and I don't get a reward. Okay? Because your dog, Sandra, cannot stay on that place cot and be committed to that cue, committed to that behavior, that exercise, and come off and chase your cat and jump your cat at the same time. I'm guessing if your dog likes to jump on you and jump on your cat, when you have guests that come over, the dog probably jumps on them as well. And so I encourage you to use that place cot for that as well to manage the behavior. If any of you are having the same kind of problem um, with jumping and you want to learn how to teach that place command, go to YouTube and do a search for the Phoenix Dog Training YouTube page. And you can take a look at the videos and there are three videos on teaching and training the place command. Again, you can go to the Phoenix Dog Training YouTube site and look for those uh, videos on teaching place. Also, if you do need a private in-home trainer, you can contact us at Phoenix Dog Training. You can go to our website, phoenixdogtraining.com, um, or you can give the company a call. Our business line is 602-769-1411. Let's take a look and see. I'm going to go ahead and join you guys live here and see what's, uh, what's happening here. Hopefully that doesn't... Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can do that, but we're going to hopefully... Now, if I lose the feed today, because those of you that have been following the show for a while know that we used to broadcast out of uh, 1100 KFNX uh, in Phoenix Radio, and we went ahead a couple weeks ago, we went to an all-online format, and we've had a few technical difficulties, um, but... We are working out uh, those technical difficulties. If for some reason we lose that feed, don't worry. Just come back to the page because I will get that uh, started back up um, right away. You don't have to worry about that. Um, So getting back to Sandra and getting back to other people, you need to teach the dog an alternative behavior. We're so quick. um, We're so quick to want to correct the dog and we haven't taken the time to teach the dog you know what it is that we really would like it um, to do Um, like i mentioned earlier today um, i'm going to be talking about clicker training the magic the power of clicker training has anybody have, have any of you done clicker training maybe uh, you bought a book, maybe you worked with a trainer that does uh, clicker training. And it's a very powerful, very powerful way to train um, your dog. When I talk a little bit about clicker training, it's important that we talk about a few things. And the clicker is just a thing that makes a sound, Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to pair that with food. We're actually, any of you know about Pavlov? Do you know about Pavlov? And do you know that uh, when it comes to uh, Pavlov, he was the one that talked about classical conditioning? Remember, he had the bell and the dogs. Remember, he had the bell and the dogs. Right. So what happened? So... Pavlov was studying salivation in dogs, and his experiments were getting messed up because when they would come in to feed, his assistants would come in to feed, they'd start salivating, and that was because of the food, okay? And basically, how do we get to this thing? I'm trying to get, I can't get over there. Ah, there it is, there it is. So take a look in that corner there. Or maybe I could just go ahead and bring up that still picture again. You present food to a dog. Look at the top. You present food to a dog, it's going to salivate. You do not have to condition food for that to be something the dog likes. The dog's going to like it. 
when the dog salivates when it sees food, that is a reflex. That's not something that the dog voluntarily did. That happened reflexively because the dog has been conditioned. Understand food is really good. Now, take a look at that second line. Pavlov decided that he wanted to see if he could cause them to salivate. So one of the things he did was he rang a bell. Now, on that second line, a bell by itself has nothing, no power. It's a neutral stimulus Okay, same thing with the clicker. So let's imagine instead of the bell that we have the clicker. Okay, and initially that clicker doesn't have any magic at all. It's like that bell in the second line. There's no response. You can click, click, click. The dog does nothing. You can ring the bell. The dog does nothing. But go to that third line. And this is where we condition a clicker. So the bell plus the food, in this case, the clicker plus the food, all right, is going to then cause salivation. We're going to do that over and over. That's part of the conditioning process, okay? We click, give food right away. Click, give food. Click, give food. What we're trying to do is make that click represent the fact that food's coming. It's what we call a bridge or a secondary reinforcer. So a lot of times... Um, we need that. We need something like that. And, and one of the reasons why we need that is because there's a few problems with training dogs. The number one problem is timing. You literally have zero to a half a second to get that food reward in your dog's mouth. What if the dog's 50 feet away from you and you gave it a sick command? What do you do? Once you've conditioned a clicker, they understand that click means treat, you can mark a behavior precisely, so much more precise, and communicate to the dog in a very clear way, that behavior you just did that got a click gets a reward. And it's very clear in the dog's mind. But first, we got to condition the clicker. Click, treat, click, treat, click, treat, over and over and over again until the dog understands that click means treat. If you do that 30 times in a row, three to four days, most dogs are conditioned with the clicker, okay? Now, one of the ways that um, this works, and when we take a look at clicker training and we start to use that in the process of training, now we can take a look at this graphic. So again, in, in this situation, we're gonna cue the dog to sit, all right? So the dog hears the word sit, then the dog's response, the dog's sitting, then we're gonna give a click, which is gonna to represent to the dog, hey, when you sat and I clicked that clicker, that's going to get you a big, big paycheck. So that's when we present the treat. So we ask for the behavior, the dog gives the behavior, we click, and then we give a treat to the dog. And that's how that particular aspect of clicker training works. Now, one of the other advantages um, to clicker training is that you have maybe multiple people in the house that are um, working with the same dog. And sometimes we use a verbal marker. Instead of a clicker, we might say yes, treat, yes, treat, and condition the word yes to be just like that clicker. But if we use a clicker, that particular signal is consistent where people's voices vary. And so it's really good for kids. And the one thing about clicker training that's important to understand, it is a total positive uh, reinforcement type training. Um, so one of the advantages of clicker training is it's fun. The under other advantages, it really helps the dog to think. They become more of an active learner rather than us forcing the dog. Because in clicker training, we don't force anything. In clicker training, we don't... Um, make them do anything. We really do a process called capturing and shaping, where your dog sits many, many times throughout the day. Your dog lays down many, many, many times a day. What if when those behaviors happened, when your dog offered them, and this is, this 
is the same for any behavior your dog offers. You didn't ask for it, but they offer a behavior. Maybe it's not on cue or it's not on command yet. You can't ask for it and get your dog to do it. But your dog's laying down 50 times throughout the day on its own. Capturing is the process of once you've conditioned that clicker, the dog understands click equals treat. When your dog lays down on its own, when it offers that behavior, you click the clicker and you give the dog a food reward. And you do that every time the dog lays down. Well, before long, your dog understands, hey, if I lay down, I get food. I get the click and I get the treat. And your dog's going to start being a laying down machine. It's going to come up to you, lay down, come up to you, lay down, come up to you, lay down. If you practice this, if you do exactly what I'm saying, if you capture the downs and you click and reward, your dog's going to manipulate the system and he's going to be giving it to you a lot. Now, when you get to that point, now you start to label the behavior. We're creating the association. Again, we're still working with classical conditioning. Dogs learn by black and white cause and effect associations. So the dog goes into the down, offers it on its own. Now you label it, you say down, then you click and give a food reward. So initially, the dog was giving the behavior on its own. We weren't asking for it. When the dog went down, offered the behavior, we click, give a treat. We did that for a while until the dog got excited, figured out the game and kept coming up to us, giving us a down, trying to get us to give it a treat. Now we can take that and as your dog goes into the down position, we can label that down and click and reward and do that over and over. Now the dog understands that the behavior of going down is related to that word going down, that cue that we have said, even though we didn't give it first. Remember, we're just labeling it. The dog does the behavior, we give the cue, it's reversed. We're just making the association. Dog does the behavior, we give the cue of down, we click, the dog gets a reward. And the dog gives the behavior again, we say down, we click, the dog gets a reward. After we've done that several times, many times, you can then ask for it. You give the cue of down and now your dog is doing the behavior, okay? And the beautiful thing about that is that you didn't force the dog to do anything. It was fun. You know, you really improve the relationship. You really improve the bond when you're using positive reinforcement, okay? Um, it, it's easy to correct your dog, but your dog doesn't come into the world knowing what it shouldn't do and what it should do. So we need to take the time to help show the dog what it is that we want it to do. Um, I'm going to talk more about clicker training and we're going to take your questions let me go ahead and open up my my browser here and see what i got going on here for some reason i got three i got three going on let's take a look here so ruth ruth has a dog and ruth says hey ruth her dog barks too much so let me go ahead and talk about uh let me talk about that so first of all we need to ask ourselves a question why is the dog barking? What is causing? What is causing the dog to bark? Okay. Um, when we're taking a look at behavior, I'm going to bring up a graphic here so everybody can, uh, can see this here. Let's bring up a still. So I want you to think about ABCs, okay? A is the antecedent or what happens right before the behavior. So maybe the doorbell rings and your dog starts barking. So A, the antecedent would be what happens before the behavior, the trigger, maybe a doorbell rings. Then B, obviously that's the behavior. In this case, we're gonna talk about barking. And a dog or any animal does a behavior. They do a behavior so that they can either get a reward or they do a behavior so they can avoid behavior is they do a behavior to get something that they like, positive reinforcement, you can see it in the corner there, and that increases behavior. Every time something happens 
after they're barking or when they're barking, if what happens is something they like, that's reinforcing, strengthening the barking. They're going to keep on going. So we need to identify what are the triggers? What are the antecedents? Now, you're not going to like this part, but too bad. You need to make sure that your dog does not experience those triggers until you have done the work of teaching your dog to be quiet on cue, on command. So what does that mean? Maybe you got to disable the doorbell. Maybe you got to put up some uh, black shields on your window so the dog can't see out the window. Maybe the dog has to be in another room at certain times. Okay, uh, maybe the dog likes to beg for food and bark. Maybe the dog comes up to you once you wants attention and starts barking. Um, so let me talk about that. You'll turn around. Don't give eye contact. Turn around. That's actually negative punishment. You're taking away something the dog wants. If the dog wants your attention, you turn away from it. Then if that happens every time, that barking is going to extinguish. Okay. Now here's the other thing, Ruth with barking. Dogs bark all the time. One of the ways you can teach a dog to be quiet, is, this is paradoxical, actually teach them to bark on command. Right? Remember I was talking about capturing that down that the dog offered, labeling it, clicking, and rewarding? Do the same thing with barking. Your dog starts to bark and you can go speak, click, and reward. The dog barks, speak, click, and reward. The dog barks, speak, click, and reward. Before long, with enough repetition and consistency, now you'll be able to reverse the process, say speak, and the dog will bark. Now, you can capture quiet when the dog stops barking and there's about two to three seconds of no barking. You can say quiet, click and reward. Your dog stops barking a lot. And if you ask the dog to bark, and it stops barking. You can work on labeling the barking. You can work on labeling quiet. You can motivate the dog by pairing that with a click and a reward. You're capturing that, and the more you capture that, and the more that you do that, the quicker the dog understands what both of them mean. So then you can ask for the barking, ask for the quiet, ask for the barking, ask for the quiet. And now, because you don't want your dog to completely stop barking, Ruth, you want your dog to alert you, right? You don't want the dog to stop completely. What you want is to be able to give a cue quiet when you've checked things out and everything's okay. And then the dog learns to be quiet. Okay, so Ruth, that is one of the things I want you to start with. Do that. Then come back next week and let us know how things are going. Um, let's see. The next question that we have is from Barbara. Barbara says, my male dog pees all over the house. And she's from Stockton, California. She's got two Yorkies, one male and a female. All right, my male dog pees all over the house. Okay, Barbara. Um, one of the things that you need to understand is that you got to start over from scratch with potty training. I don't care if you think your dog knows that it, what it's doing is wrong. I don't care if you think your dog knows where to go and it's doing this despite you. That's not what's happening. Your dog literally is confused. It thinks it can go in the house, so it does. And, you know, when we get these little dogs, I don't know what the weather's like in Stockton. It was like 113, 114 at my house yesterday at Mesa, Arizona. But if it's really hot, I know in Arizona, these little dogs, they don't even want to go outside because it's so hot, and we have to desensitize them to going out in the heat. Same thing with the rain. We rarely get rain in Arizona. So a lot of dogs, they don't want to go outside and go to the bathroom in the rain. We got to desensitize them to the rain. But when it comes to the potty training, or when it comes to your dog peeing everywhere, one of the things we got to do, all right, I talk a lot about positive reinforcement. Get your dog outside every two to three hours. Every time your dog drinks, get your dog outside. Condition your dog to the clicker. Click, treat, click, treat, click, treat. Now the click means, hey, I'm getting a food reward because that's the perfect way to begin to positively reinforce your dog going to the bathroom in the correct place. You want to get the dog out there many, many, many times to avoid accidents and to have the most success. And then you're going to click when the dog 
finishes peeing, don't click while the dog's peeing because it'll interrupt the, the dog going, you'll get up. The dog going to the bathroom and then you can click and then you can reward. Then you can start putting that on cue. You can start labeling it, but be quiet. Don't, don't label it loudly. Again, that's going to interrupt the dog from going to the bathroom. Now, when my dogs went and I'm teaching them, I go, hurry, 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 hurry. The whole time they're going to the bathroom, as soon as they finish, click, and then they get the food reward. Okay? That's step one. Step two, which is the number one rule when you've got potty training issues or you've got a dog that's destructive. Number one rule, you have to keep that dog in your eyesight at all times. And when you can't have the dog in your eyesight, the dog needs to be in a crate and that crate should not be much larger than the dog. Typically, the dogs won't soil their crate. Now, let me say this, folks. Anytime you put a dog in a crate because you can't watch them, to try to uh, make sure that they're not destructive, but in this case, make sure they're not going to the bathroom in the house. Make sure you take them outside first for about five minutes. I don't want them going to the bathroom in the crate. When you can't watch your dog, you got to put it in the crate because what we don't want is your dog going to the bathroom in the house and there's not a consequence. Your dog's not going to learn if there's not a consequence, okay? Remember this, ABC. Behaviors continue or behaviors stop based on consequences, based on rewards or punishments. Based on rewards or punishments. Okay. Now, we're positively reinforcing the dog going to the bathroom outside. We're getting the dog outside much more often to have more successes. When we can't watch the dog, we put the dog in the crate. Before we put the dog in the crate, we get the dog outside. Okay? We're managing, we're controlling things. If you really want to get this going well, keep a journal. Keep a potty training log. What time did your dog drink? What time did your dog eat? What time did your dog pee? What time did your dog poop? You're going to see after about five, six days, a pattern. You're going to learn how long after my dog eats does it have a bowel movement. And you'll start to see a pattern if you collect the data for many days. How long after my dog drinks does my dog have to pee? Again, collect enough data. Now, all of a sudden, you're able to predict pretty close. You're able to predict when your dog needs to pee and when your dog needs to go to the bathroom. Why is that important? You can set your uh, smartphone a timer, an alarm. Get the dog outside before the dog typically has an accident because you've been collecting the data and you can predict this is about the time the dog's going to go. Again, so you can have more wins, more wins many more wins. And the dog's getting rewarded for that. So the dog's going to want to do it there, okay? Because remember, there's got to be consequences in order for the behavior to continue or to extinguish, okay? So let's talk about another type of consequences that's going to help with this. Let's say that you were watching the dog and the dog just squats and goes to the bathroom or lifts its leg and goes to the bathroom right there in front of you, maybe even on you. I've seen dogs do that, okay? Talk about uh, owning their owner. But if that happens, I don't want you to yell at the dog. That's just going to ruin your relationship with the dog. I don't want you to hit the dog. Don't make it hurt. Don't cause fear or pain or intimidation. There's one simple thing that you need to do if you catch your dog in the act. Put him in the crate. Put him in the crate for about a minute or two. That's called negative punishment. What does that mean? Negative is a minus sign in, in behavior, in, in operant conditioning, in learning theory. We take away the dog's freedom when it does something we don't like to try to change that behavior. If every time the dog goes to the bathroom in the house, we put it in the crate, um, it's going to learn. Yeah, that's not a really fun consequence when I engage in that behavior. However, there was another behavior where when I went outside, the consequence was incredible. I got high value food rewards. Okay. So those are a couple tips for potty training, but Ruth, write this down. And anybody that's got a problem with potty training, marking, whatever, a dog that has an elimination disorder in the house, go to the Pet Talk Today podcast. Okay, and all you got to do is do a search on Apple Podcast, 
for Pet Talk today, look for episode 16. Episode 16 is a podcast that is entirely, the entire podcast is devoted to potty training. It's 45 minutes of in-depth information on how to potty train even the most difficult dog. Again, that's episode 16 on the Pet Talk Today podcast. Go to Apple Podcast. Hey, if you like our podcast, do us a favor. Give us a review on Apple Podcast. If you like what we're doing here, give us a review on Apple Podcast. That helps us rank higher. That helps more people be able to hear what we're talking about and get good training information. Because as I said earlier, um, not everybody can afford in-home private training. Now, um, I'm the founder and the CEO of Phoenix Dog Training. I've got a really great business here in Phoenix. Um, I do well with the business, but not everybody can afford um, training. And, And so, this is a way, this is my labor of love to give back to the community. But I need your help. I need your help by liking in the comments, I need your help by liking and sharing the video and sharing our page. Um, because again, the more you do that, the more you're helping out people that can't afford training. So anyway, Barbara, I want you to go to the Pet Talk Today podcast. Anybody else that is having problems um, with um, the potty training, I want you to make sure that um, want to make sure that you are going to that podcast, episode 16, all on potty training, okay? Well, we're going to take more questions um, in just a little bit. If, if you want to give us a call, hey, give me a call. I'd love to take your question, put you on air. Don't be shy. The number to call if you'd like to uh, have your question answered on air is 414-400-DOGS or 414 414- Four zero zero three six four seven. Hey, give me a call. We'll answer your question. Um, I don't know. Pa- is Patty? Is Patty listening? She was. She had a question last week. Um, she had a question last week about. Let's see here. She had a question last week about her dog that hates her husband and is being aggressive towards her husband. I talked to her after the show. And um, I gave her a lot of homework to do and asked her to uh, make sure that she practiced that and if she had the opportunity to uh, go ahead and um, give us some feedback on that as well. Um, Just looking through your comments here again. Why can't you post pictures, Demir? I don't understand why. Because last week people posted pictures of their dogs. I love seeing pictures of the dog. Difficulty with audio. Gloria says, Gloria, what's going on with audio? Anybody else not hearing me? Anybody else not seeing me? Anybody else have a problem with that? Uh, Please let me know. So Barbara says, what are high value food rewards for small dogs? Little bitty tiny pieces of cooked chicken. Two or three pieces of cooked chicken should sit on the head of a nickel. These should be small, really small. Now, watch your dog, right? Sometimes it's subjective. If your dog spits out the chicken, that's not a high value food reward. See, here's the thing. It is very subjective. I love anchovies. That's positive reinforcement for me. My sister hates them. She might vomit if she even sees one. That's punishment for my sister. Again, you got to try different things, Barbara. Find something that your dog absolutely loves. Just try different things, okay? Usually, it's going to be cooked meat or something like that. But again, really small. When we're training with food, they should be tiny, tiny, tiny food rewards, okay? All right, let's see if we got more. All right, so Julia, what if, where'd you go? What if your dog can't do crates? Well, I don't know if you're still listening, Julia. Your dog can't do crates. Um, Gosh, if you can call in, I can get more information about why you can't do crates. I don't know if your dog has separation anxiety. I don't know if your dog um, has just anxiety being in that enclosed space in a crate, but there's lots of things you can do, all right? You can start the process if your dog doesn't like a crate by just putting the food bowl and the water bowl in the crate and leave the door open. You know, if your dog wants to eat, it's got to go in there. 
If your dog wants to get a drink, it's got to go in there. Don't do anything. Don't close the door. Don't say anything. Let the dog go in and out of the crate to eat its food and get its water. And then maybe you put some toys in there and it gets its toys out of the crate, okay? You're, you're, because a lot of people try to force the dog in the crate. They slam the door shut and the dog screams and cries. And then what do you do? You open the door. You give in. You let the dog out. Now, remember, here, let's go back to it. Remember, ABC, okay? Dogs crying in the crate. That's the behavior, all right? The consequence is you give in and let the dog out. So guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Negative reinforcement. The dog felt pressure. The dog did not like being in the crate. And as soon as you let the dog out of the crate, that pressure, that something the dog didn't like, got removed. Remember, reinforcement means strengthen. So that strengthens a behavior. They learn that behavior becomes very, very functional. If I cry and I'm in the crate, mom or dad will give in. They'll let me out. Therefore, why should I stop crying? Okay? The other thing you need to do besides feeding in the crate and putting water in that crate is you need to play the game of tossing a treat in the crate that high value, high value food reward. Your dog goes in the crate when all four paws are in there and it goes to get that food treat right before it grabs that food reward that you tossed in the crate, click. So again, dog goes in, click, the dog gets the food that you threw in. The dog, you throw food in the crate, the dog goes in the crate, click, and right before the food. So now we're creating associations. The dog starts learning, mm, this behavior gets me a food reward. All right? But you got to precondition the dog to the clicker first. Okay? So... Once you've got that, now you can start just like everything else. I mean, there, a lot of this stuff is similar. Now you throw the food in the crate. The dog goes in there, label the behavior kennel, then click and treat. Throw the food in the crate. The dog starts to go into the crate, say kennel, click, the dog gets the food over and over and over. Then after you've done that for several days, you know, you've been throwing the food in the crate with your hand, okay? Fake the dog out. Go like that, but don't have food in your hand. Have food in a treat pouch, but not in your hand. Go like that and say kennel and see if the dog goes in. The dog does. Click. Now throw some food in that crate. Does that make sense? After you've been throwing the food in the crate first and the dog followed and you've been labeling it kennel and you click and the dog eats the treat and you've done that for maybe a week, now don't have food in your hand. Pretend you do. Go like this towards the crate door and say kennel, just like you did if there was a treat. See if the dog goes in. Now what does this become? It becomes a hand signal. And you can begin to open that hand little by little as you do that. Make sure that you're clicking and rewarding the dog. Now maybe the next part is we've got to work on having the dog in there with the door closed for three seconds. And then five seconds. And then ten. And then a minute. Do it very, very gradually. But... Dogs are great at picking up patterns. If your dog is nervous about being in the crate, if your dog has separation anxiety, if you keep leaving the dog for little and little and little more time, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, you get the idea, okay? If it keeps on getting longer each and every time, the dog's going to figure out there's a pattern and start getting anxious. Oh my God, each time it's going to be longer. Yeah. Dogs are great at figuring out patterns. So you've got to trick the dog. You go out, you go out for a second, you go out for three, you go out for five, you go out for one second, come back. You go out for 15 seconds and 30 seconds and 45 seconds, and then you go out for three seconds. You've got to toggle back and forth between adding more time away from the dog and than giving some really short duration when you're doing it. Now, you've got to do this three to five times a week. The, you're going to do this about, uh, oh, five, 10, 15 minutes each time. But if you spend a couple of weeks doing this, then you shouldn't have a problem with that. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Having poor reception. Anybody else? Well, nobody else has. Oscar? 
Tara, how are you? Lambo and Zelda. Thanks for watching, everybody. By the way, if you're just joining us, I'm Will Bangura, and you've been listening to and watching Pet Talk today. We're here each and every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m., where we take calls and we take your questions in the comments section and provide you with practical solutions to your dog training and puppy training uh, and behavior problems. So if you've got a question about a dog, if you've got a behavior problem, if you'd like some advice, go ahead and type your question into the comments section. Let us know where you're listening from as well. And please do us a favor, like, click on that like button and go ahead and click on that share button as well. We really appreciate that. Um, let me go to, let's see here. Is this the same crate I put them in for peeing in the house? Yeah, absolutely, Patty. I mean, you should have one crate that you use, okay? And, well, you could have several crates, really. But it really doesn't matter, I, I should say that. If you only have one crate, fine, use that one. If you have more than one crate, use a different one. It really doesn't matter. Uh, the whole idea is that you put them in the crate, okay, when they have an accident. And that's negative punishment. And that is a consequence that they're not going to like. And so that's part of how we would, uh, we would deal with that. Patty, Patty, Patty. Where are you, Patty? Well... Guess what? Patty was really nice about letting me uh, record her question. Um, Patty, for short, um, I have a problem with my dogs. I, we just adopted them about three and a half weeks ago, and for some reason, they're extremely afraid of my husband. Um, they're they're poodles. They're uh, very small dogs. One is a little bit smaller than the other. <laughs> Anyway, I'd like to have some help in trying to get them to not be so fearful of my husband. Um, what, what happens when they see him, when he comes out of the bedroom in the morning, they start barking. The little one growls at him and charges at him. Um, the, the one that's a little bigger, she's so afraid that she would tremble all over. I adopted them, or we adopted them from a shelter here close by in Arizona, Chance Shelter. Um, they're both poodles. Um, they don't have much training. Uh, we even have to try to housebreak them because they're, they're not housebroken. They're t about two years old, I was told. I don't know what to do to she gets a uh, get them to not here. be so afraid of my husband. My husband's tried all kinds of things to get them to not be afraid of him, and nothing's working. If you could help, I really appreciate it. Oop, wrong one. So let's talk about this. You know, now I talked to Patty. I was hoping she'd be able to be here this week, but apparently she wasn't able to be here. Um, this is when we start talking about classical counter conditioning. And counter conditioning is just a fancy word for pairing something positive, a trigger turning a trigger into something positive where right now it's something bad or miserable for the dog. In this case, these rescue dogs that they've had for a little while, and these dogs probably had trauma. There's probably all kinds of stuff, but it takes a while. It can take, you know, two to three months before you really see what these dogs are about when they get into a new home. But right now they're scared to death of your husband. They're growling at your husband. This is a big, big, big problem. Okay. Here we go, back to this graphic, the ABCs. What's the antecedent? What's the trigger? It's your husband. We know what the behavior is. What's the consequence? What's the reinforcer? Yeah, so what was happening is Patty's husband is now leaving the room, creating distance and space when the dog growls and barks and lunges at him. So this behavior that the dog's doing becomes functional because the dog views the husband as a threat and he wants that distance. And so when the dog engages in that behavior and her husband moves back, that's exactly what the dog wanted. Again, this is negative reinforcement. The husband is pressure. The husband is aversive in the dog's mind. All right, remove the husband. You remove the aversive. You remove the pressure that will reinforce the behavior of growling. So the first thing we need to do, and I told Patty, 
we've got to stop reinforcing the behavior. And then the other thing that Patty was doing, she was positively reinforcing the behavior by picking up the dog. Okay. When the dog did that behavior and then picking it up and the dog got more comfort. And so why should the dog give up that behavior if things happen that are beneficial for the dog? Okay. So we got to take the things that are beneficial to the dog. We got to remove those consequences. We got to remove the reinforcers first and foremost, because we're never going to stop the behavior. We need to remove the trigger. What does that mean? Husband got to move out of the house? No. However, all right, when the husband is out and about for now, temporarily, the puppies, the dogs, the rescue dog should be in another room, preferably crated. Now, I don't want them living in that crate. Trust me. Okay. We've got to keep the dogs from rehearsing the behavior. And I tell this to everybody, regardless of the problem. Listen, if your dog continues to rehearse an unwanted behavior over and over and over, um, and it's getting reinforced, trust me, or they wouldn't do it. There's some kind of consequence. There's some kind of reinforcer. You got to look for it. But if the dog continues to rehearse the behavior, it is going to get more deeply conditioned. It's going to be very difficult to counter condition that behavior out. So let's talk about how do we counter condition? How do we pair something positive? Okay. Remember the dog wanted distance from her husband? So the first thing we do when we expose exposure therapy, counter conditioning, desensitization, when we expose the husband to these dogs, it has to start at a very, very far away distance. They got to be able to see him. They got to be able to know he's there. But the distance between the dogs and the husband needs to be a distance where those dogs don't have a care in the world. Because here's what we're going to do. We're going to have the husband come out from around the corner as soon as he appears Feed, 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 continuously, constantly, high value food rewards. Then the husband goes out of sight. Then as soon as the husband's out of sight, boom, we stop feeding. Wait a few seconds. Let the dog settle. Husband comes out from around the corner. As soon as the dog sees the husband, feed, 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 feed constantly and continuously for a few seconds. Then the husband goes away. Stop feeding. As soon as the husband's out of eyesight, stop the feeding. So what we're doing is we're pairing high value food rewards to the trigger, but we've got the trigger, the husband at a far enough distance where the dogs don't have a care in the world. Listen, if your dog has even got the slightest bit of concern and anxiety, when you're feeding, you're just reinforcing the anxiety, that state. We need to be creating associations. We need to be reinforcing. We need to be feeding that relaxed or neutral state where the dog doesn't have a care in the world. Now, don't worry about whether or not your dog begins to understand or like your husband yet. What we want to worry about is we're, we're teaching a game. Trigger comes out, you get food. Trigger goes away, food goes away. Trigger brings good things. In this case, your husband's bringing these good things because it's paired and associated with him. At some point, if your timing's good, your dog is going to figure out the game. And when it sees your husband, when it sees the trigger, boom, it's going to look to you to get its food if it's hungry. Do this when your dog's hungry. Don't do this when your dog has just eaten. Okay? Do this when your dog's hungry. When your dog learns that game and starts looking at you for the food, as soon as the trigger comes out, now that's a signal that you can move the trigger and your husband a little bit closer to the dog. Don't get greedy though. Don't go so close that the dog starts getting anxious. Again, the distance we do the counter conditioning, the distance we're pairing high value food rewards with the presentation, with the exposure of the trigger, the husband, all right, the dog can't have a care in the world. This is slow it's a very slow, gradual, systematic approach to desensitization and for counter conditioning. Um, this can take weeks. It can take months. Um, you can only work as fast as the dog is willing to go. You got to work at the dog's pace. Otherwise, um, the dog experiences stress, anxiety, and you're reinforcing that. But I'm going to tell you, the people that do exactly what I'm saying, they avoid the triggers. 
I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But what's the alternative? Dealing with the behavior? That's hard too. Okay? Get rid of the, get rid of the triggers, even if that means removing the dogs. Okay? Stop reinforcing the behavior. Start being very, very proactive and do counter conditioning and desensitization. And you need to do that three to five times a week or forget it. It's not going to do anything. Three to five times a week. Your sessions are going to be five, 10, 15 minutes long. They're going to be short. Okay. But if you'll do that, oh, looks like we got, hey, it looks like we got a call here. Let's see here. I'm trying to get you on here. Ted Talk today. How can I help you? Hi, is this Will? This is Will. Who's this? Are you calling Pet Talk today? Yeah, I am. Okay. Um, I spoke. I spoke to you last Saturday. My name is Patricia Rohan. You know, Patty, were um, you listening on Facebook because I was just telling the story? You know, I just I've been having such a hard time this whole week. Okay. That um, Patty, let me just say I, something. I've got you on on the air, so okay. If you don't want to okay. say something for everybody to hear, don't say it. Okay. How did think, okay. did you practice some of the stuff we talked about? Oh yes, I absolutely, and that's the thing. Um, I've been trying to do exactly what uh, the email that you sent me. I've been trying to do that with my husband. Yes. Um, unfortunately, my husband isn't available all the time, and that and he's the one that needs to be in here more than any of us because it's because they don't. They're afraid of him that, right. that this whole problem is happening. How often is he available? Um, well, lately it's been really difficult. Because first of all, he's been he's had a bad reaction to the um, vaccines for COVID nineteen, okay. and um, he he's just extremely extremely tired. Yeah. So that's one problem. The other problem is that when he can do go do things, he He's out doing them, and and that leaves him out of the picture. So that's the biggest problem, I think. All right, now here's um, the thing. Here's the thing, Patty. I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of tough love here, okay? Because we're sure. talking about a training session that can last okay. five minutes or less, and something that you do three to five times a week. Everybody can okay. come up with five minutes. It yeah. has to be a priority. Okay. It has to be a priority. Okay, because again, are these dogs, have you been keeping them away from the hus your husband so they don't keep rehearsing the behaviors? Yeah, I've been trying to do that. Okay. Um, I have gates up. No, they can't uh, see them. The they can't see them. They can't see No, him. because they're going to get anxious. Okay. They cannot see him. Yeah. All right, you got to oh, You got to keep the trigger away. And that's why you've got to be proactive doing the work. Okay. And, and for yeah. the other listeners, um, I realize this is really inconvenient. You've got better things to do. But in this case, Patricia, what's the option? I mean, how long can this behavior go on before you need to rehome these dogs? Well, my husband's already telling me that he, he thinks we ought to send the dogs back to the shelter that we got them from. Well, I, yeah. you, I would have you tell your, you tell your husband that Will Bangura... Associate Applied Animal Behaviorist from Phoenix Dog Training and DogBehaviorist.com is saying he's not being fair to these dogs because he hasn't even put in any effort with what I've told you to do, which will work, by the way. I thought you were calling to tell me, oh, man, things are a whole lot better because that's those are the calls I typically get. But if you're not practicing, if you're not practicing, then, then things aren't going to get, they're not going to get better. And you're yeah. just, and, and your husband's not going to get happier. Okay. And guess nope. what? How old are these dogs? Well, we were told at two years old. Okay. So here's the thing. And I don't know if I told you this last week and, and everybody that's listening, the number one cause of death, the number one cause of death for dogs under the age of three, you know what it is? Behavioral euthanasia. Euthanasia. For behavior problems, because the dog was barking, or the dog was lunging, or the dog was peeing in the house, and people don't do the work, and then the dog goes to the shelter. And, and listen, those of you that think you can give it to a no-kill shelter and it's going to live forever, no, 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 no. Those no-kill shelters get full, and when they've got dogs that sit there and don't go anywhere, guess where those dogs go? They go back to the county. 
Yeah. yeah. The no kill shelter didn't kill him, but the county euthanized him. Number one cause of death, dogs under the age of three, behavioral euthanasia. Patricia, can you stay on the line? I've got to go ahead and close out the show, but I want to talk to you a little more, okay? Yeah, I'll stay on. Okay, sure. very good. Well, everybody, it's been a wonderful show. Uh, thank you for everybody that uh, asked your question. I appreciate that. Um, please tell your friends, please tell your family about Pet Talk today. Again, we're here each and every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. taking your questions, taking your calls, and helping you by providing you with practical, positive solutions where you can improve the relationship and bond between you and your dog, and you can stop pulling your hair out of your head, being so frustrated. Come back next Saturday. We're going to have a great show. Also, never miss an episode of Pet Talk Today. And we've got other um, topics and other shows that we do on the podcast that never make it to uh, Pet Talk Today on Facebook. So go to Apple Podcasts, look up Pet Talk Today, and there's a lot of great information there. I think we've got right now 61 episodes on the Pet Talk Today podcast. Do us a favor. If you like what we do, give us a review on Apple Podcasts. That brings our podcast higher in the rank rankings. And then those people that can't afford training um, can get the help that they need. Look, folks, I don't sell you anything. I don't make you listen to commercials. Um, I'm not pitching anything. Um, this is a labor of love that I do so I can truly give back to the community. But I need your help. I need you to spread the word so that more people can benefit uh, from what we're doing. Anyway, thanks, everybody. We will be back uh, next Saturday. Have a good weekend. Train, train, train. Love your dog. Take care.